Uh, ever since uh, 2001, when Colin Baker introduced the term uh, translanguaging to uh, really introduce Ken Williams' uh, work on Welsh revitalization uh, programs, it really captured uh, people's imagination, as it were, that most reliable source of uh, knowledge uh, uh, tells you, uh, this was, I think, done uh, uh, about a month ago. There are nearly 100,000 uh, uh, hits in uh, Google uh, with the term, uh, for the term translanguaging. And in Google Scholar, that is uh, scholarly uh, publications, uh, we have over 5,000 publications with translanguaging either in the title or in the abstract. Uh, and that is uh, not quite as many as superdiversity, but superdiversity, of course, is not a linguistic concept. It's more of a sociological concept. It should have more uh, citations, but way beyond uh, any other kind of competing uh, uh, terms. And these um, uh, scholarly publications really cover a wide range of topics from translanguaging pedagogy, translanguaging practices in everyday uh, interaction, translanguaging across more modality, linguistic landscape, um, to translanguaging and visual arts, uh, translanguaging and music, uh, and transgender uh, discourse as translanguaging as well. So together they give the kind of um, uh, impression that any practice that is slightly non-conventional, whether or not it involves different languages, could be described in terms of translanguaging. And in, in the meantime, you see plenty of other uh, terms competing with translanguaging for academic discourse space. Now, today I'm going to uh, discuss some of the fundamental theoretical issues related to the concept of translanguaging. And I'm going to focus on the areas or spaces in which, uh, uh, in which the theoretical discussions of translanguaging are actually happening. The traditional uh, research agenda of these uh, areas or spaces and what translanguaging contributes to the discussion and debate in these areas. And I will also say something about the future directions of this work. It's really important to say from the uh, outset that the term translanguaging isn't uh, my in, uh, invention. And in fact, most of the people who are using these, uh, the, the term these days uh, did not actually invent it. Uh, and of, because of this, people who are using the term are also trying to define in, in their own ways. And I'm going to tell you uh, about my ideas of translanguaging which may be somewhat different from other people's ideas about it, but I really want to acknowledge the contributions of my friends and colleagues uh, to my uh, thinking about translanguaging, our fantastic team whose work you will hear uh, a lot about in this uh, wonderful uh, summer school here in Birmingham for the entire week. Um, and my immediate colleagues in UCL Center for Applied Linguistics, um, and three other research groups in uh, UCL, and it's really important to acknowledge their contribution. The Multimodality Center, led by uh, Gunter Kress, Kerry Druitt, and Jeff Vesmer, and the Deafness Language and Cognition Center that I'm also uh, working in. Uh, they're working on uh, sign bilingualism. And uh, the Multimodality Lab in the Division of Psychology and Language Sciences, whose work hugely influenced uh, my thinking as well. And we have a across London sociolinguistic group who discussed this work with me on numerous uh, uh, informal uh, occasions. And of course to uh, Alfredo Garcia and uh, uh, Ricardo Tigi uh, for really supporting me uh, throughout this uh, 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 journey. And there are many, many others who uh, I don't have time to, to mention. I'm going to start with uh, Claire Crumb's uh, uh, 2015 uh, paper in the uh, special issue of applied linguistics, where she called for uh, an applied linguistic theory of language practice. To me, her call is extremely uh, timely. 
Applied linguistics uh, has borrowed many different concepts and methods from other disciplines. Um, uh, and way beyond linguistics. Uh, yet we own very few theoretical concepts and analytical methods of our own. And that's uh, somehow uh, uh, quite a sad fact uh, for me. And the disciplines from which we have borrowed concepts and methods pay very little attention to what we as applied linguists do in return. Applied um, uh, is often taken as uh, synonymous of atheoretical, therefore of lower scientific value. Many of the uh, Many of us would not actually mind that uh, because we are in, indeed uh, interested in policy and practice concerning language and how to uh, uh, solve real world uh, problems in which language is a central issue. That's often uh, how applied linguistics is defined. On the other hand, many of us would also like to think that what we do is or should be theoretical. We're offering new thinking and new ways of looking at language learning, language policy, everyday linguistic practices in society, not just practical uh, solutions. So how about uh, starting with an applied linguistic uh, theory or notion of what language is. I think that's what uh, Claire Quamsch really uh, uh, was asking for. Other branches of um, uh, linguistics have articulated their ideas of language much more explicitly, often couched in informal, in uh, functional, or cognitive terms. And I would like to suggest translanguaging is a good candidate for a practical theory of language, as Claire Cramsh called for. And I also believe that translanguaging as a theoretical perspective developed in applied linguistics can make an important contribution to linguistic theory generally with its own conceptualization of language. It enables us to address some bigger theoretical questions in linguistics and beyond, which I believe is important for the future of our discipline. Now, uh, Kramsch went on to explain that what she had in mind for a practical theory of language is a kind of a Bourdieuian uh, theory of practice. And of course, she uh, is uh, a fluent reader uh, of uh, Bourdieu in, in the original. Uh, but my own cultural and educational background is rather different, as you can imagine. So here's the person whose work I read uh, or read uh, extensively in my youth. Admittedly, we had no choice but to. Uh, but some of his ideas were, uh, or are still quite useful in my, in my view. Now, I've chosen uh, a, a rather useful uh, image of Mao there because before he became the founder and the ruler of the People's Republic of China. He was a philosopher and thinker and wrote many stimulating pieces uh, that critiqued both the Confucius philosophy as well as the Marxist theories. Uh, one of the most influential pieces was On Practice. And if you really want to follow this up, you, you, you have it in English as well. It was originally published in 1933, advocating a so-called dialectical uh, materialist uh, philosophy of knowledge acquisition. That knowledge is wrought through practice. That's the main uh, uh, theme. And he emphasized the independence of theory on practice, uh, the dependence of theory on practice. In other words, theory is based on practice and in return serves practice. And the process of theorization or knowledge construction involves a perpetual cycle of the practice, theory, practice. Now, from this uh, perspective, the crucial first step in knowledge uh, construction is descriptive adequacy. And the notion of descriptive adequacy is really important in linguistic theory, because Chomsky in the 60s uh, wrote a whole book about it. Now, it's not accuracy. Yeah? No one description of any actual practice is necessarily more accurate than another. 
because description is the observer analyst's subjective understanding and interpretation of the practice or phenomena that they are observing. Interpretation is experiential and understanding is dialogic. A practical theory goes for a holistic account of the observer's best, uh, to the observer's best ability and descriptions of as much that has been observed as the observer can, not just a selection of segments of the data to justify some pre-specified theoretical hypothesis. So, as a result of that, it's the richness and depth rather than what Chomsky called elegance when he talked about descriptive adequacy in formal rules in his uh, 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 65 book that are the key measures of a good description. Yeah. And in turn, a good practical uh, theory. It's important to stress that the most, uh, the, the main objective of a practical theory is not to offer predictions or solutions, but to achieve better understanding by offering interpretations that can be used to observe, interpret, and understand other practices and phenomena. The theory should provide a principled choice between competing interpretations that inform and enhance future practice. And as such, it should raise new questions rather than simply providing solutions or answers. So at this point, uh, let me explain the kinds of linguistic practice that I'm particularly concerned with in order to explain why I think translanguaging offers a better explanation than other concepts as a practical theory of language. The first set of examples comes from a corpus of what I have called New Chinglish. And some of you uh, will have uh, heard me talking about it uh, elsewhere. Um, these are creations of multilingual, by multilingual Chinese netizens of words and expressions that they hurt broadly to the morphological rules of English. So they look kind of like English, but with Chinese twists and meanings. So these examples um, look English, but a monolingual English speaker would find it difficult to understand precisely their meanings and connotations. And, these, uh, and there are phrases and sentences as well. They're not just single words. There's a large corpus on, online that you can all uh, look at. It seems to me that existing terms such as code switching, code uh, mixing, borrowing, or meshing cannot fully capture the creative and cr uh, critical dimensions of these expressions. The second example is provided uh, by a colleague of mine from uh, Singapore uh, who recorded a long exchange between uh, Jamie, a, a Chinese Singaporean in his 50s, and an old uh, family friend Sito, who uh, just lost her husband. Now, this is the typical everyday speech of ethnic Chinese Singaporeans. I've colored, uh, coded different stretches of the exchange, but this is hugely problematic. As questions such as what languages they're speaking or how many languages uh, are being spoken here won't take us very far. A purely structural analysis misses more than they can review. A classic uh, code-switching approach would assume switching back and forward in, uh, a single, uh, uh, to a single language default, and this would be the wrong, the absolutely the wrong assumption to make about this community of multilingual speakers. I have many examples of the dynamic and creative uh, linguistic practices that involve flexible use of uh, named languages and language varieties, as well as other semiotic uh, uh, resources, such as Kongish Daily. Many of you uh, are familiar with this, a, f a Facebook site where daily news items are translated into a, a kind of Cantonese-based text mixed with Hong Kong English, emoji, phonetic symbols, and many uh, different uh, uh, signs as well. Again, no monolingual uh, and no monolingual in one single modality can appreciate such text in full. And that's the key point I want to make. 
My concern here is that traditional approaches to multilingualism that promotes the more the better, uh, multilingualism is about more the better, seems increasingly inadequate for the linguistic reality of the 21st century. Yes, we have seen significant progress in certain parts of the world where multilingualism in the sense of having different languages coexisting uh, alongside uh, of uh, well, alongside each other is beginning to be acceptable. Um, what has remained hugely problematic is the mixing uh, of languages. The myth of a pure form of a language is so deeply uh, deep-rooted that there are many people who, while accepting the existence of different languages, cannot accept the contamination of their languages by others. The practices in the Singaporean uh, example are in fact under threat from Chinese Mandarin bilingualism. You can have those two languages separately, but not the kind of mixture you, we saw earlier. And the compartmentalization of languages, or what has been called the complementary distribution principle, is kind of dominating uh, uh, the language policy there. We live in an era where simply having many different languages is not no longer sufficient, either for the individual or for the society as a whole. But multiple ownerships and more complex interweaving of languages and language varieties where boundaries between languages, between languages and other communicative means, and the relationship between languages and the nation state are being constantly reassessed, broken, and adjusted. No single nation or community can claim the sole ownership authority or responsibility for any particular language, and no individual can claim to know an entire language, rather bits of many different languages. What's more, communication in the 21st century requires much more involve, involvement of what has traditionally been viewed as non-linguistic means and urges us to overcome the lingual bias. The post-multilingualism era raises fundamental questions about what language is for the ordinary folks in their everyday life, in their everyday social interaction, questions to which I believe translanguaging could provide some useful answers. So I'm going to, what I'm going to now do now is to try to explain the theoretical motivations of having the term translanguaging and its added value. Uh, I also want to highlight some of the contributions uh, translanguaging as a research perspective can make to uh, the study of language and linguistics in general. Now, the origins and development of translanguaging as a theoretical uh, concept, there are at least four closely related but different areas from which uh, translanguaging as a theoretical concept uh, originated. And I'm going to go through these uh, and point out the uh, re research agenda in each of them and what contributions translanguaging has made and can, or can make to this field. As I said earlier, uh, the term translanguaging is not the invention of most of the people who are using it these days. It was Colin Baker's English translation of Ken Williams' Welsh term which he coined to describe a classroom practice that Williams observed um, <coughs> Yeah, so, th sorry, these are the four uh, um, uh, areas where uh, the concept of translanguaging uh, originated. I'm going to go through uh, uh, them. The first is the uh, minority language re revitalization, minority language maintenance area. Williams observed in Welsh revitalization programs where teacher, the teacher would try and teach in Welsh and the pupils would respond largely in English. Sometimes the language choice would be reversed uh, where the pupil, pupils would read something in Welsh and the teacher would offer explanations in English. Such practices uh, were by no means unique to schools in Wales, but in the so-called indigenous minority language re revitalization field, there is a strong belief that maximum input needs to be given and safe space needs to be provided for the minority language to be revitalized. And the other languages, especially the dominant languages, should not be used or at least kept 
be kept to the minimum. And we see very similar beliefs and practices in most situations of endangered languages as well, where the protectionist discourse and ideology is very strong. Now, I don't have time to engage in the, discu in the discussion or debate with, uh, with, with these uh, uh, fields uh, here. But what uh, William suggested was that instead of viewing the, the use of English in the Welsh revitalization program negatively, it actually helped to maximize the learners as well as the teachers' linguistic resources um, in the process of problem solving and knowledge construction by fully acknowledging the bilingual potential of the pupils. They are not monolingual Welsh speakers and will never be monolingual in Welsh alone. What I like about Williams and Baker's uh, idea of translanguaging is that it's not conceived as an object uh, or linguistic structural phenomena to describe and analyze, but a practice and a process, a practice that involves dynamic and functionally integrated use of different languages and different language varieties through different modalities. But more importantly, a process of knowledge construction that goes beyond languages. Ophelia Garcia, who extended the idea of translanguaging uh, from indigenous minority language re revitalization to bilingual education of minoritized la uh, learners in the U.S. in particular, uh, she, uh, particularly she was particularly concerned with the labeling of so-called bilingual uh, learners. Uh, in, in, in the context that she worked with, bilingual learners is actually a largely negative label. What the label says about these learners is that they are non-native uh, uh, speakers uh, or L2 speakers of English, or they speak English as an additional language, imme immediately inferior to the so-called native or L1 English speaker. And they are students with interrupted formal education. The label also assumed uh, that these uh, learners' language practices are incomplete from a monolingual perspective. And there is a great deal of interference between the different languages. They also sold an, uh, an additive or double monolingualism model uh, in, in terms of education, where their languages should be kept separate. And the education they are given is a remedial one, usually in the dominant or politically uh, speaking uh, in the wider uh, uh, society, the dominant language only. And the focus is very much on the language structure. So the subjectivities constructed for these so-called bilingual learners are they don't know English, they only know Spanish, they don't know uh, about content, they don't know anything, or they need remedi mediation, uh, they, they need to be separated or segregated. And their, their Spanish is actually not as good as a native monolingual Spanish speaker either. Uh, Garcia argued for a major policy change from a monoglossic bilingual education policy to a heteroglossic bilingual education policy through translanguaging. Multiple discourse practices in which bilinguals engage in order to make sense of their bilingual worlds. She argued for bilingual education and ed education generally as a translanguaging space where teachers and uh, students go beyond socially constructed language and educational systems, structures and practices to engage diverse multiple meaning making systems and subjectivities to generate new configurations of language practices and education and to challenge and transform old understandings and structures. In doing so, orders of discourses shift and the voices of others come to the forefront, relating the translanguaging agenda to criticality, critical pedagogy, social justice, and linguistic human rights agenda. Now, over the years, translanguaging has proven to be an effective pedagogical practice in a variety of educational con uh, contexts where uh, the uh, school language or the language of instruction is different from the language of the learners. 
by deliberately breaking the artificial and ideological divides between target versus mother tongue languages, minority versus my, uh, 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 majority, indigenous versus my immigrant languages, and so on. Translanguaging empowers both the learner and the teacher, transforms the power relations, and focuses on the process of teaching and learning, on meaning making, enhancing experience, and developing identity. For me, the translanguaging pedagogy also helps to re examine an age old question of the role of. Um, um, uh, the, uh, the role of uh, L1 in second foreign and additional language teaching and learning. And I'll come back to that uh, 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 later. Uh, as explained in my uh, 2011 uh, article in the Journal of Pragmatics, my idea of translanguaging actually came uh, from a, a somewhat different source. And it was uh, rather generous of the Bangor uh, group of education researchers led by Colin Baker to acknowledge that in their review of the development of the concept of translanguaging. Now, my interest was initially triggered by the notion of uh, languaging. Um, in, uh, in a short commentary on uh, Fred uh, Neumeier's uh, short essay on the origins of language, uh, Pete Becker, uh, an American anthropological linguist, invited us to think that there is no such thing as language, only continuing languaging. Now, this argument has been followed up by others, other researchers in at least two uh, uh, different ways. Perhaps the best known work on languaging in applied linguistics is the uh, work of uh, Miro Swain, who used the term to um, describe the cognitive process of negotiating and producing meaningful, comprehensive output as part of language learning as a means to immediate cognition, to understand and problem solve, and the process of making meaning and shaping knowledge and experience through language. And she gave specific examples of the advanced second language learners cognitive and effective engagements through languaging where talking it through means coming to know while speaking. And I particularly like the um, connections Swain and others made between languaging and thinking, cognizing, and consciousness. But I wanted to ask the question how the thinking process is affected by simultaneous use of multiple languages of the kind we saw uh, um, in the Welsh classrooms that uh, uh, Williams uh, studied and in many other bilingual and uh, multilingual educational uh, context. I also wanted um, to extend the discussion uh, beyond advanced second language learners that Swain was uh, mainly concerned with to include different types of multilingual language users and to find a term that would capture their talking it through in multiple languages, however incomplete or truncated their knowledge of the individual languages may be. And it is the entirety of the learner's linguistic repertoire that I'm con con concerned with rather than knowledge of specific structures of specific languages separately. Another line of uh, inquiry uh, into languaging has been uh, pursued from the perspective of distributed cognition and what has become known as uh, e ecological psychology. And uh, the, uh, the, most of the people working uh, on that topic or from that approach are associated with these uh, uh, two journals. And I'm on the editorial board of Language Sciences, and that's where my connection, uh, as it were, uh, uh, is. Um, here, languaging refers to uh, an assemblage of diverse material, biological, semiotic, and cognitive properties and capacities which languaging agents orchestrate in real time and across the diversity of time scales. Um, following Nigel Love, who was the uh, editor of Language Sciences, uh, scholars um, uh, in, uh, cognitive, uh, in, in distributed cognition uh, and uh, integrational linguistics, really, 
set out to challenge what they call the code view of language that sought to identify abstract verbal patterns divorced from cognitive, uh, effective, and bodily uh, dynamics in real time. They regard language as a second order construct, the product of first order activity, languaging, and argue that human languaging activity is radically heterogeneous and involves the inter interaction of processes on many different time scales, including neural, bodily, uh, situational, social, and cultural processes and events. They urge linguists and um, uh, psych uh, psychologists and others working on human communication to grant languaging a primacy over what is languaged. Now, I found this particular uh, way of conceptualizing languaging really appealing for a number of uh, uh, reasons. First, it invites us to rethink language not as an organ or organism-centered entity uh, with corresponding formalisms, uh, but as a multi-scalar organization of processes that enables the bodily and the situated to interact with situation um, transcending cultural, uh, historical dynamics and practices. It sees the divide between the linguistic, the paralinguistic, and extralinguistic ex uh, dimensions of human communication as nonsensical and emphasize what they call uh, the orchestration of the neural, bodily, worldly skills of languaging. In particular, it highlights the importance of feeling, experience, history, memory, subjectivity, and culture. They don't uh, talk about ideology and power, but it's entirely conceivable in the way they approach this that these two play important roles in languaging. In orchestration, no one instrument is more important than others, and their contributions to meaning making cannot be measured in purely quantitative terms. These are really important arguments about uh, languaging and translanguaging. On language learning, uh, this particular view advocates a radically different perspective on the, that the novice does not acquire language, but rather they adapt their bodies and brains to the language activity that surrounds them. And in doing so, they participate in cultural worlds and learn that they can get things done with others in accordance with the culturally promoted norms and values. This view uh, is very similar to the uh, language socialization's view and the complex dynamic systems perspectives on language acquisition and language learning. Now, by adding the trans uh, prefix to languaging, I not only wanted to have a term that bet better captured uh, multilingual language users' creative and dynamic practices, such as those in the examples I, I showed you earlier, but also to put forward two further arguments. One, multilinguals do not think unilingually, even when they are in a monolingual mode and producing one language only for a specific stretch of uh, 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 speech or text. Two, human beings think beyond language, and thinking requires the use of a variety of cognitive, semiotic, and modal resources, of which language in its conventional sense of speech and writing is only one. Now these are uh, about two of the fundamental theoretical questions in contemporary linguistic theory. Uh, language and thought, a modularity of mind. And this is where I think applied linguists really do have the capacity to contribute something very significant to linguistic theories and models. There is, a, of course, a third uh, area that translanguage also raises uh, very fundamental questions, and that is about language evolution, but I won't be addressing it here. Now, with regard to the first point, there seems to be a real confusion between the hypothesis that thinking takes place in the language of thought, in other words, thought uh, possesses a language-like or computational uh, uh, structure, and that we think in the language we speak. 
The latter seems to be more intuitive and commonsensical and has indeed attracted a great deal of attention by researchers uh, through rather elaborate experiments um, uh, and, and provided uh, some interesting evidence that speakers of different languages, pro uh, say, process uh, motion uh, events or shape and color differently uh, uh, in different languages. Now, for me, this line of argument is not all that different from earlier observations that speakers of um, uh, uh, English, uh, uh, Semitic, Oriental, uh, Romance, or Russian languages had rather uh, different uh, rhetorical uh, uh, patterns as uh, uh, Bob Kaplan's uh, work uh, demonstrated. But it has really uh, uh, kind of uh, been um, uh, uh, critiqued uh, by many people uh, uh, over, the, over the years. Uh, it remains a highly controversial topic, of course, not least because it cannot address the question of how bilinguals and multilingual language users think without referring, uh, re without referencing notions of L1 native or dominant language separately. For me, one of the most important and challenging issues in bilingualism and multilingualism research is to understand what's going on when bilingual and multilingual language users are engaged in what Grosjean called the bilingual mode and what David Green and myself called an open control state, where they constantly switch between languages. It's very hard to imagine that they would shift their entire frame of mind so frequently uh, in an, a conversational episode, let alone one utterance. With the examples I showed you earlier, a question such as which language is the speaker thinking in simply does not make any sense. The language we individually produce is an intellect, our own unique personal uh, language. And if we follow uh, the argument that we think in the language we speak, then we think in our own intellect, not a named language. But the language of thought must be independent of these intellects, and that is the power point of uh, Jerry Folder's theory. We think beyond the artificial boundaries of named languages in the language of thought. So this confusion really triggered a, a whole uh, a line of research which has led to uh, very little uh, uh, value to me. We must not forget that the names and labels that we use to talk about languages are names and labels assigned by linguists to sets of uh, structures that they have identified, or we as linguists have identified. And often these la names and labels are also cultural political concepts associated with the lang one language, one nation, or one language and one race ideology. From a historical perspective, human languages evolved uh, from fairly simple com combinations of sounds, gestures, icons, symbols, etc., and gradually diversified and diffused due to climate change and population uh, movement. So if we deny uh, uh, climate change or block population movement, we won't have linguistic diversity or change. And uh, speech uh, communities were formed by sharing a common set of communicative um, uh, practices. By in incorporating elements of communicative patterns from other communities has, uh, has always been an important part of the selection and competition or survival uh, process. And the naming of languages is again a, a, a largely linguistic practice and is a fairly recent uh, phenomena. And the invention of the nation state also triggered the invention of the notion and the ideology of uh, a mot a monolingualism. What we call translanguaging is using one's idiolect, that is one's linguistic repertoire, without regard for socially and politically defined language names and labels. From a translanguaging perspective, we think beyond the boundaries of named languages. This is not to say, it's really important to stress that, that speakers are not aware of the existence of the language boundaries. As part of the language socialization, 
translation process, we become very much aware of the association between race, nation, community on the one hand, and a named language on the other. And of the discrepancies between the boundaries in linguistic structural terms versus those in social, cultural, and ideological terms. But we also have a translanguaging instinct which enables us to resolve the, bond, the differences, the discrepancies, inconsistencies, and ambiguities if and when they need to be resolved and manipulate them to our strategic gains. Now, the second argument regarding thinking beyond language uh, really regards thinking beyond uh, uh, language. It concerns the way in which the modularity of mind hypothesis, also uh, originated by uh, Jerry Fodor, is interpreted and operationalized uh, um, in research. According to Fodor, uh, the human mind consists of a series of innate neural uh, structures or modules, which are encapsulated with uh, distinctive information and for distinctive functions. And language is but one uh, module. This is somehow uh, been uh, understood or, or misunderstood to mean that language and other human cognitive processes are autonomically and or functionally distinct. Therefore, a, a, a research design, in research design, a so called linguistic uh, and non linguistic cognitive processes would be assessed separately. Um, so uh, I, I'm just going to give a, a, a quick quote from uh, um, uh, Guillaume Thierry, uh, a leading neuro neuroscientist based in Bangor in the, in the uh, former ESRC Center for Bilingualism, uh, who has the following to say, making a distinction between language and the rest of the mind is meaningless. Making such a distinction implies that language and mind are two, uh, um, uh, are two uh, 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 ensemble, ensembles that uh, can be uh, delimited uh, as if one can draw a line between the two, or indeed trace a line around language within the mind. There is no such thing uh, as a language-specific brain area. There is no such thing as a cognitive operation uh, that is wholly independent of language processing and vice versa. Um, because of the time, I won't uh, really go uh, through the, uh, the details uh, of, uh, of the evidence, but uh, Really, from a translanguaging perspective, language is a multisensory and multimodal semiotic system interconnected with other identifiable but inseparable cognitive systems. We can identify uh, uh, cognitive systems, but that does not mean that we can separate them from language. Translanguaging means transcending the traditional device between linguistic and non linguistic cognitive and semiotic uh, uh, systems. And in fact, there is a lot of re uh, recent discussion about the whole existence uh, of the uh, so-called broker's area responsible for language alone. Uh, and uh, uh, there are many really interesting uh, uh, debate uh, uh, about it. Um, the last bit I want to really uh, uh, say is um, uh, about uh, translanguaging and multimodality. Translanguage embraces the social semiotic perspective on uh, uh, multimodality, which is uh, better known in applied linguistics than the uh, multimodal uh, communication research uh, on, on sign language, for example, and also on gesture and other uh, ways of communication. There is an extensive literature on multimodality communication, uh, uh, but not the um, uh, social semiotic approach that I'm going to uh, uh, mention. In the social semiotics of uh, multimodality, linguistic signs are part of a wider repertoire of modal resources that carry particular social, historical, and political associations that sign makers make uh, use to serve strategic purposes. Translanguaging foregrounds the different ways uh, language users employ, create, interpret, and interpret signs to communicate across contexts to perform different subjectivities, and highlights the ways in which 
multilinguals make use of the tensions and, and conflicts among different signs because of the social political associations the signs carry with them in the cycle of re semiotization as the new uh, uh, English examples uh, I showed you earlier illustrate. So from a translanguaging perspective then, language is a multilingual, multi-semiotic, multi-sensory and multimodal resource for sense and meaning making. The added value of the concept of translanguaging uh, highlighted in the trans prefix to languaging by referring to the fluid practices that go beyond, that is transcend socially constructed language systems and structures to engage diverse multiple meaning making systems and subjectivities. The transformative capacity of translanguaging process, not only for the language systems, but also for individuals' cognition and social structures. And the transdisciplinary consequences of reconceptualizing language language learning and language use and uh, work across the device between linguistics, psychology, uh, sociology, and education. Translanguaging does not deny the existence of named languages, but stress that languages are historically, politically, and ideologically defined entities. It defines the multilingual as someone who is aware of the existence of the political entities of named languages and has an ability to make use of the structural features of some of them and uh, that, that they have acquired over time. It's a research perspective that challenges conventional approaches to multilingualism. For me, it has never been the intention for uh, translanguaging to replace code switching or any other existing term. Um, But, but translanguaging uh, it really wants to move uh, from the uh, uh, code view of language uh, to a different uh, perspective, and it is a practical theory of language, therefore an applied linguistic uh, theory that comes out of practical concerns of understanding the creative and dynamic practices human beings engage in with multiple named languages and multiple semiotic and cognitive resources. It reconceptualizes language, uh, as I uh, said earlier, as a multilingual, multisensory, multi uh, semiotic and multimodal resource for meaning and sense making. It has the capacity to en enable us to explore the human mind as a holistic uh, multi-competence, as Vivian Cook uh, describes it. But in addition to the detailed uh, analysis of multilingual uh, practices, the concept of translanguaging also enables us to ask uh, some bigger questions about some of the fundamental concerns of linguistic theories, language evolution, language and thought, and how we understand the modularity of mind hypothesis, and to demonstrate that applied linguistics can make a significant contribution to these theoretical issues. And the ideas presented here today are also described in my uh, chapters in the book that I edited with v uh, Vivian Cook, and also an article that uh, should really come out in the first issue of Applied Linguistics uh, next year. Now, I want to uh, conclude, this is my uh, last slide, actually, I want to conclude by introducing uh, you to a very short video clip by uh, an American uh, uh, author, Daniel Jose Oda. You, you, some of you may have uh, read some of his uh, novels, and this is really interesting. This, this uh, um, video clip is uh, entitled, Why I Don't I Italics? Italicize. Let me. 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 Miss. Let me. 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 
Lemis, 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 Lemis. He defines the difference between code switching and translanguaging very clearly and vividly, and really also raises important issues uh, about language and identity and all the rest of it. And that's a really great example of what tr the translanguaging perspective can do for us. Thank you.